Hey everyone, Happy New Year and welcome back to Unity Roundtable, a series where we discuss Unity-related news, tips and tricks, tutorials and more. This week, I hopped on a call with Freya Brightwater, the lead 3D software engineer at Anything World, who shared some insights on the latest and greatest features the platform has to offer and the various ways it can be used in your Unity projects. But before we get started, I'd like to mention that my content is powered in part by my patrons, the subscribers of Andrew David Plus. More on this at the end of the video. If you haven't seen my previous quick one about it, Anything World is a powerful plugin that allows you to populate your game with 3D models at runtime based on keywords or search phrases. Wow, cool! Since then, they've greatly improved the feature set and implemented a really impressive machine learning powered rigging system. So previously we used joint space animation system. So we used the Unity joint system for a bit. We were using sort of physics to animate our segmented models and then building animations out procedurally like that. That was kind of the first iteration of our animation system that we were using. But that was in preparation. So for the past like three years, our machine learning team been working towards generating rigs for three models and then applying animations to those AI generated rigs. The previous physics based system was like intermediate step between that and this version that we're now bringing out. So we obviously had the sort of, we got the segmentation and the sort of identification of different models and what kind of type they were first. And then we did the second stage of it, which was sort of how to understand those from a rigs perspective and then how to apply animations to those rigs afterwards. One thing that's great about the new rigging system is that in addition to coming with ML powered animations, which we'll get into later, it also allows you to rapidly get started with a rigged model without being restricted to the animations that Anything World provides. If you'd like to simply generate models and apply your own custom animations, the rigs will be available for you to do so. However, this new system is only in its MVP stage at the moment, so it does lack a few features that were available in the previous system, which you can still access via the website. So we haven't currently integrated the voice creation side of the package into this early access one yet. That's just because we're planning on building a more fully featured system to bring into this package, so sort of a new voice system that's hopefully going to work a lot better with the new animations that we're bringing out. They did also do an overhaul of their UI, which comes with a new set of features. So we now have a sort of favorites tab, for example. You can now store lists of objects, for example. You can like objects. We also have sort of voting systems now, which is kind of quite new. We have a bit more filtering options for the UI, so it hopefully makes it a lot easier for like objects to be brought in. We've made the kind of entire interface to be a bit more responsive as well, hopefully. And with this new panel as well, we've also brought in some more creation options for the models that you create through our panel. So previously you could create models in the scene and they would be brought in through like a sort of default position and there wouldn't be much customizability. We've had a lot of different sort of transform options and some default animation behaviors that you can sort of set and override. So you can sort of add uh, animation behaviors based on different subtypes of model that we have on our database right now. That's currently sort of in development, so it's subject to change um, in the next few versions potentially, but we have a few different types of animation available. Currently it's using the legacy animation system. This is just because that's the only animation system that Unity offers that allows us to load in animations at runtime as well as in editor. We're also going to have support for the standard Mechanum blended animation that a lot of users will be familiar with. That's kind of the editor based animation system. And we'll be ready to support for that as well. Probably in the next few versions, we'll be extending to that. So currently, the animations that Anything World handles specifically cater to quadrupeds and ungulates. These are all automatically mapped animations. None of this is sort of done by hand. And so these are the first uh, iteration of our animations. So I think over the next few months where we will be both expanding the categories we have a roadmap to bring in new types of models that haven't had their animations applied to them yet um so for example this is going to be like aquatic animals and like sort of uh, snakes and uh, things that basically aren't quadrupeds or ungulates as well which are like sort of sheep and horses and uh, hooved creatures that we have currently animated in this version and then yeah through the roadmap we'll be extending that into the other categories that we haven't yet covered of course you can accomplish all that through the ui but if you'd like to stream generated models directly at runtime, you can achieve that through their API. The API, which is a semi-separate thing, but I would say that the API is actually really powerful if users want to directly access it through whatever they're doing. It just allows users to be able to like really quickly request in an object without having to do any networking coding. Um, the API is definitely a great choice because you get a lot of information about the model, which you get in mm -hmm. this package as well, but it's like, I guess, less easy available. Um, we're working to make it sort of more accessible in this version of the package anyway. So we can serve up all the different file formats for 
animated objects. So we can have like FBXs for each of the animation clips. You have like metadata about what kind of animal it is, like the tagging system, um, the size and the speed of the animal. So all these kind of like extra metadata objects that kind of differentiate it from previous model APIs that have been around. But you can kind of see that by just uh, by just calling this anything make term, you can. This is, for example, uh, I don't know if you can see it well. This is an example of just bringing in an animated cat, mm -hmm. and then you can pass in a rotation as well. And then sort of these are other examples of different parameters that you can pass in. Um, so there's a lot of different options, and these are all kind of documented on our uh, Git book um, our documentation website. And you can also you can also pass in uh, types of behavior as well to behavior scripts to part to apply to attach to these game objects after they've been created. The metadata that Freya mentioned here is actually quite robust and gives you a lot of control over the models you're generating. For example, you could add specific components to only large objects or add child prefabs inside objects that have a specific tag only. Yeah, with the metadata itself, we have a combination of manual tagging that we've done. For a lot of models, we've collected data ourselves and then put that into our database. We also have done sort of web scraping and automated data gathering and from the tags and from the data the names of the models that we received we sort of generated etymological tree basically so sort of seeing where the word roots are and from there we can sort of determine that like sort of a dog is part of the sort of canid family which is like an animal which is like a sort of living creature so we have sort of that kind of entity that entity tree which is sort of was quite a, a fun way of sort of understanding the models for the size and the speed and those kinds of fields. Those have been a combination of manual data entry and automated data gathering as well. Earlier, I mentioned that the animations are powered by machine learning algorithms. Here's a quick breakdown of how the internals of that works. We have an in-house animator who sort of builds a data set of um, animations that we use to train our machine learning algorithm. Yeah, for any generation of animations, you obviously need a lot of input data. So we are in-house generating clips that we then use to apply to different uh, types of animal skeletons. So there is hand animated clips being used, but then they're being transformed during the process when they're being applied to the model. So there is some transformation there as well. But obviously with any machine learning process, you do need input data as well. Over the past few years, we've sort of identified different subcategories of animal and then sort of trained a few different sort of ways of categorizing and segmenting those animals. And so through that process, it allows us to build rigs that kind of fit different archetypes of creature and then from that we can then map the animations to those rigs in a way that kind of makes sense from a physiological standpoint so if they have longer tails then the sort of animation gets mapped accordingly um, so we kind of have a data bank of um, angular movements and then for quadrupeds we'd have a, a bank of sort of quadruped movements and because the skeletons for each of the models will be sort of adjusted to fit that particular model the movement will then will be scaled through the mapping process so if it has a longer tail then that movement will be translated onto that longer tail through the AI. In order to keep anything world as flexible as possible, you'll notice that none of the generated models and rigs come with physics systems applied to them. This allows you to apply your own controllers or physics systems after generating to keep all the systems in your game consistent. Um, so obviously with the previous system we had a lot of physics based stuff going on um, and while this was good in some situations it meant that in a lot of situations the users were not familiar with the physics system or the joint system. They have issues with performance as well so for like more lightweight for lightweight consoles or for like mobile devices having a lot of different physics based animation systems was just completely out of the question with the current animation system this is like a standardized statics animation clips animation clip based system which is as a performance you can get for animations pretty much using rigid bodies no problem after generating a rigged model at runtime via their api simply add the rigid body component and of course anything world isn't just about adding dynamically rigged models and animations you can also use it to populate your game world we have a lot of static assets as well um, it's not just mm -hmm. animated assets. Anything World's ability to stream generated models at runtime means that it has the potential of being a great storytelling tool. But in the context of using it in your own indie games or game jam projects, there are also a lot of use cases for the platform. There's the side of it which is within the editor. So that is during the prototyping, during the development. The users bring in assets during the development stages and then obviously using that in a sort of, in a standard way that developers do use assets. So like creating scenes, using 
the models and then using the animations and then plugging them into their own uh, movement controllers. So it doesn't necessarily have to be passive. So using them as sort of assets is one use case. And then, then we also have the streaming or runtime use case where you can use like our API to bring in models after you've distributed your game. The team at Anything World is currently in the process of developing a web portal, which would allow you to upload any model you create and pass it through the pipeline. And so when that's completed, users will be able to automatically go to the website and upload their model and have the model understood, which is like sort of segmentation, categorization of the model, and then this metadata that I was talking about applied to it. And then once the system's done that, then we can map animations to it. Once uploaded, you should end up with a model that has all the appropriate metadata, tags, and rig that you can then stream into your game via the API. And of course, I'm sure that long-term support, stability, and fallbacks is something that comes to mind when deciding to integrate a service that requires API calls at runtime into a game that you plan on publishing. And the team at Anything World has taken this into consideration as well. With this new system, we have callbacks. You can pass it an on failure or on success into your make request. So what this allows you to do is basically sort of uh, do a behavior in the event that either when it gets created, it, it will invoke that action and pass in data about the object that failed or succeeded during the make process. This means it's up to you to handle the error, either by showing a built-in fallback model of sorts or a more rudimentary error. And they do have a few contingency options in mind in case the service ever gets shut down after you've already published a game that streams models. We have quite a big runway and we're, for as long as we are able to, we will be offering support in the eventuality that we something did happen, um, we would definitely contact affected parties and see if there wasn't some kind of workaround that we could do to allow them to use the assets or back up the assets that they were using within their game. Um, but hopefully that will never come to pass. Uh, but I think if, if you are really worried about that, then um, we're going to be offering ways to serialize the assets that we, you can request from this. So if you're doing it kind of, if you're doing the editor workflow, we're going to be offering ways to serialize the animation clips and the models uh, within the asset database. And then obviously that's the kind of a standardized asset that won't go away. Um, so if users want kind of to do it that way, then that's absolutely that's fine, we don't mind. And you don't need to worry about having to update your game every time the Anything World API gets updates that contain breaking changes either. So for breaking changes, we use versioned API calls. So previous versions shouldn't be affected by forward changes. We did have that issue previously, but we contacted all of the parties currently using the API and uh, just coached them on which fields to update. But going forward, we're using versioned API calls. So um, that shouldn't be a problem. Try it out for yourself in your next Game Jam game, maybe in the upcoming Global Game Jam, and let me know what you think. There's definitely a lot you can do with Anything World in Unity, and I'm curious to see what you can achieve when you think outside the box. And if you're interested in more AI-powered tools, take a look at this video right here. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe if you're new to the channel. By subscribing to Andrew David Plus, you get early access to videos, behind-the-scenes content, exclusive monthly video updates, access to join our private Discord hangouts, and more. Thanks for tuning in. See you on the next one.